Hey everyone, welcome again to another episode of AdsCast. I hope you're doing well and staying dry because it's miserable out there today. I uh, just want to thank everyone for their ongoing support. We've almost hit 50,000 subscribers across all of the platforms, so please don't forget to hit subscribe and the like buttons. It means the world to me. Uh, today I'm delighted to be joined by someone who, um, anyone in the UK who uh, is an avid sports fan or um, follows either live sport or talks about sport, uh, and that's freelance journalist Kim Kathari. Um, Kim is a regular on Talk Sport, on Sky Sports, um, and I'm delighted that he's taken time out of his day to join me today. So Kim, I really appreciate it. How are you doing today? Yeah, very well, thank you. Like you say, it's absolutely horrible out there, isn't it? Uh, I'm just looking to <laughs> see if there's any sort of bit of nothing dark grey and there's just not that I can see. Not a good day. <laughs> Unfortunately, January in the UK, uh, that's that's what you expect. Unfortunately. Not the one. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, because um, we have listeners and subscribers from around the world, uh, yeah, as I said, you're, you're a regular on things like Talk Sport and Sky Sports. And Sky Sports for us is a bit like ESPN in the States. It's pretty much the number one sports broadcaster here, obviously with affiliates around the world, Italy, Germany, everywhere else. Talk Sport, I think, through airtime and listeners is the biggest sports radio station certainly in europe possibly the world i can't yeah the world the world so um uh, yeah i'm uh, i'm thrilled that you're that you're here how did you um how did you get into it what's what's the story there for anyone who's kind of interested in journalism or sports writing or anything how how does somebody start in that progression to get into that into that world so i think my route was probably quite different because i figured out quite late that i wanted to go into journalism and then only when I was doing my master's in journalism, I realized actually sport is where I want to be. So I did an undergrad in philosophy. Then I moved back home to Manchester after university. And I, I had no idea what job I wanted to do because I didn't really have, I was good at writing essays and I was good at arguing and debating, but there weren't like that many transferable skills from that degree. And I kind of just thought like, what do I enjoy doing the most? And what I enjoy doing the most is talking, writing, having, you know, having conversations. And I think, well, the perfect way to do that is to do a journalism master's. So I went to London, packed up my things, went down south, did my journalism master's. And obviously that was interrupted by COVID, which was a massive shame because we had all these really big plans. There's like a thing at the end of the master's called Multimedia Fortnight, which is going to be like this amazing event of like fort a fortnight of like different industry leaders coming in and assessing your work. And obviously we couldn't do any of that, but I got really lucky that one of the radio shows that we were doing as part of the course one of the heads at TalkSport joined the Zoom call to kind of make up for the lack of this multimedia fortnight. So he joined. And I remember afterwards, I think I just followed him on Twitter, sent him a DM and said, like, can I come in for a tour of the studio one day? Went in. They were really, really accommodating, really, really nice. Got on with them really well. And then I got home that night and I think about four hours later, one of the management texted me saying, can you come in next week to start some work? And that was just kind of answering the phones to listeners. And I did that for about six months and then moved up to production. That's <clears throat> that's pretty unbelievable. That was one of the things I was going to ask you about, because with such a relatively short career, as you were saying, you were sort of finishing your master's at around the time of COVID and all that kind of thing, to then jump into and be so sought after, for want of a better term, that you're on two of the flagship mainstream broadcasters, radio and TV, in such a short space of time. That's unbelievable. It's uh, uh, it's kind of like it's almost like serendipity, like right place, right time. COVID. This guy just so happened to be part of your course, and then yeah, and here you are. It's 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 mad. I mean, truthfully, it doesn't feel like it's been that quick. There's been a lot of like slogging to go through, and even now, because I'm freelance, you know, I will go and you know, I've got to tell the truth. Here, I will go like five, six days without any work, just because that is the nature of freelance reporting, and you just have to say yes to everything. So it has been a massive slog, but the new opportunity and getting on kind of every Thursday morning on Sky is literally like what dreams are made of for me. Obviously, I've grown up watching it, and it's been absolutely amazing and. As you say, I think this industry and I think journalism in general, but specifically sports journalism, there just is a lot of luck involved. There's a lot of nepotism involved, like there is in most industries, but there is a lot of luck. You know, there are times where one of the main reporters just hasn't been able to do something particular at TalkSport and someone said, well, will you just go down? All you have to do is record a little two minute piece and then that goes well. And you've got such a big listenership on that show. Put it on LinkedIn, put it on Twitter and different people just 
kind of pick up on it. So I have definitely been lucky, but but it's been um it's been quite a hard slog, and it doesn't feel like it's been that short a career. I've got to be honest. <laughs> so it's like months feels like years kind of thing. It really does, especially when you're getting up at half three in the morning for the for the talk sport breakfast show. It's um it's tough. Well, <clears throat> there are uh, more difficult things in <coughs> life than having to work alongside Laura Woods. Let's just say that. Well, I'm not complaining, and I'll be honest with you. If for- very different reasons. Alan Brazil as well is just the funniest human being on planet Earth. I uh, I once uh, bumped into Alan Brazil, and this is the most random thing ever. This was outside the uh, the passport office in central London, so very near Victoria <laughs> Station. And this is like sort of half 12 in the afternoon. And he's walking along, and this is not because he's a slightly larger Scot or anything with a carrier bag. But uh, he did look like a drunk, just randomly walking the streets. And I thought, you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna walk up to him because you know when you did that double take and you think that can't be Brazil. So you go up yeah. and say, all right, Al. And it was, and he was literally just like he was on the radio in, in person. No, that is, that is just who he is. He's the funniest person I've ever met in my entire life. Just him telling any sort of simple anecdote just has me in fits. I mean, I think the Scottish accent, especially the Glaswegian accent is pretty funny anyway, but like the way he conveys things is so funny. I mean, I don't actually think, bearing in mind I worked on his show for two years, I don't think he knows my name. He calls me Stroller because I apparently stroll around the office. And about, I think I'm, I must have once walked slightly slow and then for him that was it. He'd come up with Stroller and that was it for the next two years. He's honestly a proper character. <clears throat> so I have to say, yeah, it was it was the, the funniest experience ever because you've got Brazil there on the pavement and on the radio he is just... A bit like he can't pronounce any name, like you just said with the with the Glaswegian accent, and I don't think he knew what day of the week it was, and it was he's it just was, it was the best thing, the best thing. He's he's honestly just a proper character. He's exactly is he is just exactly what he is like on radio. But actually, to be fair, he's more tamed down. He's more like tamed. He's more toned down on radio. Like when you get him in the pub after the show, honestly, some of the things he comes out with are just like <laughs> like no, but like you know when you laugh so much that you actually like feel sick. <laughs> I, towards the end I'm not joking I can actually show you towards the end every time I'd go out with him I used to write down on my notes the things that he would say just so then when I went home I could look at them and I could just remember them and just start laughing again he's <laughs> he's the biggest character in the world man <laughs> no I, I love that I, I love I love the fact that you've, you're working on people like Brazil show yeah you said it was a bit of a slog but it's clear that you're passionate about what you do and what's great is in your instance somebody who's clearly passionate about writing presenting having you know conversations dialogue clearly you've got a big sporting background as well um and you've been given this opportunity and you're thriving it's not one of those where it's like a slog and you're like oh i'm getting bogged down by this you can tell there's that hunger and it's great that that hunger is now manifested its way into like you just said you're you're on breakfast show national radio you're on at seven o'clock pretty much every thursday on sky sports i mean that's a that's a big deal how many people behind you would kill for that opportunity I know I've I've got to remind myself of that sometimes because quite a lot of the people who I came up with at Talksport or who kind of joined a little bit after me, just because of circumstance and obviously I think I'm not really that polished yet and I think I've got a lot of learning to go and they probably just learned a bit quicker. So I'm always comparing myself to them and they're doing like amazing things and they're on all the time and they're in the studio. So a lot of the times I think I'm quite negative about myself. I think that's just natural. I think we all have our have our little kind of negative thoughts about what we're doing but you are right like sometimes i do just have to remind myself like my housemates upstairs in his boxes getting ready for work watching me on tv recording from downstairs on sky like it's, <laughs> it is mad it is obviously mad and i and yeah i, lo- I, I love it i mean I, I really love it i'm so excited by it all and i just want more i just want more and more opportunities and that, that's you a, know, that's, this... that's an exclusive by the way that anytime <laughs> that on thursday morning seven o'clock when you're being interviewed don't pan the camera down because you're in your your box oh yeah yeah <laughs> i mean he upstairs honestly is just like snacking in the morning in his boxes just sending me pictures of me on tv it's crazy it really is <laughs> no i i love that i think um I, I like you just said i love the fact that that is the sort of like you just said what you want to do and you're sort of grasping it with both hands and you know yes okay fine there's a there's a three o'clock star whatever but you're embracing that i i think that's you can you can tell that some people just go through the motions and you can tell some people are really sort of um like geared up for it revved up for it just going on your point where you said you're a little bit raw and not polished and whatever i don't think that's a bad thing i you see i think there's there's such a thing as being too media savvy 
too polished and sometimes you want an opinion you want a bit of controversy yeah. you want a bit of oh i don't just want to say the right thing or whatever so, you know give give the honest opinion you know give that kind of um it's almost like a fan answer you know where it's a little yeah. bit, like a bit raw a bit you know that's I th and that's what everyone says in the media you know footballers or whoever it is is in front of the camera media training and all that I yeah i mean the, the industry has changed massively i mean i'm obviously like quite young mixed race northern like when i was growing up there's no one like that on sky sports there's no one like that in the media at all it's kind of like you've got a demographic which is sort of your middle class middle age white man speaking in a particular way that is kind of what the industry has been dominated by and it is changing massively there's not that same level of seriousness that there once was there's a lot more kind of participation from people who are likely to have opinions and people who strongly feel in certain ways and i think that's obviously a huge huge benefit to people like myself because 10 years ago these opportunities certainly wouldn't have been arising for me and i'm glad that that is changing and i think look like with social media content just is changing anyway mm. like we have we have amazing opportunities to deliver stories and opinions in so many different manner of ways and i think that's really really helped young people in my industry specifically one of the things i've picked up on when i have heard you and watched you speak especially when we're talking about a particular passage of play rather than say a contract situation or whatever is it's clear that at some level you've played the game that you're talking about so you have an understanding of what you're talking about so if you were talking about a match or a sequence of play or whatever you've got some people who are very articulate and they can describe it but they can't really describe the the moment or the scenario or whatever and that doesn't mean you have to say oh yeah when i played i did x y and z but there's a way that someone speaks and i think what's changing more and more is the people who might have done a journalism degree and know how to be a wordsmith and whatever are becoming less I don't want to say relevant, but anyone who can talk with a bit more passion or it's clear that they've played the game or they have an understanding or just a love of the sport are beginning to come through. That's what I would say that new wave is. And I'd say you're definitely a part of that. Definitely the way that you deliver is is better than somebody who's just more of a polished wordsmith. And I think that's yeah. why, I think that's added to why you're you've got your regular spot. No, 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 I completely agree. And I didn't look like I'm completely obsessed with football. And the way I think about it is like, if I wasn't working, talking about football or like helping produce shows, talk about football, I would just be at home talking about football anyway. So it's like, it doesn't, it doesn't really ever necessarily feel like a job, especially the kind of paper talk things are really, really great first step because I'm also a freelance reporter at Sky, which is very different. The kind of press conferences, you have to kind of not, I wouldn't say toe the party line, but you have to ask the questions that are going to get the best interaction and aren't going to upset them out, you know, you know, the, the, that kind of thing. But the talks, the, the paper talk thing, when it is just pure opinions, it's fantastic. It's an amazing opportunity because you're working, but all I'm doing is saying what I was saying to my pals last night, like, Oh, this is a terrible sign. And I can't believe they're doing this, but I'm just expressing it in a slightly more articulate way and using slightly less swear words or whatever. But it, it it doesn't feel like a job because I actually love the sport so much. Like it dominates my life. I play it like three or four times a, a day, a, a week. Sorry. I watch it every single night, you know, like, like you say, yeah. Um, I'm just completely obsessed with the sport. So it really helps. It, it really helps. And I think it comes across. I'm glad you said that as well. No, it definitely does. And I think that is, I, I think as you become more prominent, I think, the way that you deliver your opinion, whether it's transfer talk or manager speculation or passages of play or how a team is doing, that's where you start to see a bit of a separation. And I think that slightly older hat way. Um, and I also hate people who sit on the fence. Um, I respect yeah. some of the pundits out there, but I also <laughs> get livid with them. Somebody like Martin Keown, who I've got a huge amount of respect for, played the game. He's an invincible, all that kind of thing never makes an opinion always sits on the fence to the point where yeah. um obviously he works on the same radio station that you do and the host of the show that he's a, you know a participant on makes a, a joke on a daily basis that you know get off the fence kind of thing whereas you will actually deliver your opinion and i think that's what people so it resonates with people yeah definitely i think that like football is supposed to be fun right all sports are supposed to be fun at the end of the day they are supposed to be entertainment and there is a danger that we do take it too seriously sometimes like we try and like over analyze everything and try and think about like the right outcome or 
you know, like, oh, I knew this player was going to do this or whatever. But like, it's just a game of opinions, really. And that's what makes it so great. That's why you can go to the pub with your pals and you can sit there for 10 hours if you can hack it. And you can speak about football for the whole 10 hours because it is just, it's all about opinion and there's so much nuance to it. And it's so interesting to talk about and it's so interesting to get other people's opinions on it which is why like you say it's disappointing when you get former pros who know the game so well they've played it they know everyone in the game and you want them to just give like a solid nice opinion which can then influence your decision and can influence your opinion or you can just completely go against it and you know that, that's kind of the whole point but it's really frustrating when people sit on the fence and I and I don't want to do that I think because I'm at the beginning of my career as well, I don't really want to upset anyone or a particular fan base or anything like that. So I think maybe I tone down my opinion slightly, but I will always give it at the end. It will all, the, the message will always come through. I'm glad you said that because, and again, this is sort of like a, a lucky right place, right time thing for you. This season that we're having now in the Premier League must be along with, you know, Leicester and, and and some of those other ones, it must just be a gold mine for you. It must be the season that keeps on giving. You know, we've got an unexpected leader. We've got title favourites who don't look like they, they, they're going to mount a challenge. You've got people like Liverpool and Chelsea who are fighting over mid-table. We've got Everton, who have just obviously sacked Frank Lampard. We've got VAR decisions all over the shop. So never-ending list of things to talk about. So for you you must be sort of rubbing your hands thinking this is just like one of the best seasons you could possibly wish to sort of uh, commentate on really. Absolutely. It's a gold man this season. I mean, you mentioned Everton. So I started Paper Talk four or five weeks ago. Every single section, every single week, there's been a section on Everton. They are mm. a gold man. They're mm. absolutely a disastrous situation at the moment. I feel incredibly sorry for all the Everton fans. But I would say for a journalist, for a broadcaster, this has been an unbelievable season. I mean, you look at that league 12 downwards, I think Forest are 12th or 13th, and you look downwards, those teams are all really, really quite poor and any one of them can go down. You have no idea what's going to happen come the end of the season. The Arsenal situation, of course, is really, really interesting because it's always great. I mean, look, I'm going to be honest, I'm a Man City fan, so I don't want Arsenal to win the league for obvious reasons, but it's always great when a sleeping giant performs really, really well. And it, it is unexpected. I think we all knew Arteta was going to do well at Arsenal. Well, that's not a surprise, but the speed at which it's come about is very surprising. They're halfway through the season, they've got 50 points. They could go on and do the Centurions like Manchester City did. You know, they are on course for that. So, yeah, fantastic, fantastic season to work on. I think as a fan, I'd like to get your opinion on this because maybe mine's slightly tainted by City's performances. I think in terms of quality, I think the Premier League has has never been this bad in the last 10 years. I think in terms of the actual quality of teams, the Premier League is really bad because you've got your Liverpool's, Chelsea, Spurs all underperforming, Man City underperforming. As I mentioned, you've got the whole bottom half of the table, which pretty much any of them can go down. It's only really Arsenal who are playing scintillating, exciting football every day of the week so as a fan not the best season i don't know what do you think <clears throat> it's funny you say that i was just looking at the table now the bottom seven clubs are separated by three points three that's what points. i mean and you know the only other league that i see that kind of um <clears throat> grouping of clubs is in the championship which is statistically mm -hmm. the most competitive and difficult league i think <clears throat> in the world yeah i've never seen the premier league condensed in the way it is now um on your point about quality it's a funny one because I, I, going back to timing, I think I've, I can't recall a season like it. And I'm unfortunately old enough to remember every Premier League season. <laughs> uh, I don't remember a single season, and I'm just looking at it now, where so many big clubs or clubs that have been in, say, the top 10 for the last five, 10 years have yeah. been going through transitional seasons for whatever reason at the same time. You know, you look at Manchester City, I don't really, they, they've obviously signed Haaland. They've gone away from that kind of false nine, no striker philosophy. And they've gone for an out and out striker. And I think the impact it's had on their team can't be underestimated. I think the fact that they've lost two stalwarts in the squad, which is Zinchenko yeah. and Jesus, uh, they've only, they're only a year away from having lost Fernandinho as well. Um, I don't think you can underestimate how big a loss all of that is and how big a change. Harland's been. Yeah, no, I agree. I look at Man United. Obviously, they've obviously got a new manager and all the rest of it. The club's up for sale, playing staff, and all that kind of thing. So they're they're all over the place. 
you've got Newcastle, they've just been bought. Eddie Howe, I think, has done a, a job. That Unbelievable no, job. No one could have predicted how quickly he has yeah. gone from... Incredible. The, uh, so they're, they're there. You've got Tottenham, who are doing what Tottenham do, which is flirting with being successful, but are they actually going to get over that line? You've got Liverpool and Chelsea, who for different reasons, it, they just haven't got started yet. I think Villa... It's a shame because I think everyone wanted Gerard to succeed because of his playing career, and they it didn't work out. So they're trying to play Not. catch, yeah, and they're playing catch up for what was a difficult start. I think Emery will get them, you know, solidly. Certainly. Them. So yeah, it's it's funny, isn't it? You've got a lot of underperforming clubs, and then you've got somebody like Fulham, who I don't think anyone would have fancied to be seventh. You've got Brentford, who last year I think Thomas Frank was just out of this world. How well they yeah. did. And everyone's yeah. like, oh, second season, what will they do? Blah, blah, blah. Look where they are. You've got Fulham, Brighton, Brentford above Liverpool and Chelsea. I mean, it's crazy, isn't it? I mean, it's fantastic. Like, don't get me wrong, as a neutral, it's absolutely fantastic that these kind of traditionally smaller clubs can compete and can do well and are competing for the European positions. I think my point is more just that I was the gonna quality come... of the big teams is lower. I was going to come back to that. And I think, I think you're right. And. <sighs> This was one of something I was going to ask you later in our conversation. And is, is the mid-season World Cup partly to blame? Is it the fact yeah. that players were thinking, I cannot get injured November time, that's me done? Were they saving themselves? Did we... I mean, there was a thing, wasn't there, with Christian Romero at Tottenham? <clears throat> he didn't play for a month. And the rumour was he was fine. He just did not want to get injured. Yeah. Goes through the World Cup, comes back, everything's fine. The flip side of, of that, of course, is you've got Gabriel Jesus at Arsenal banging the goals in in the first half of the season. He's done his knee. He's out for three months. So I don't know if that's partly to do with it. I think you're absolutely right that Man City, inexplicably, don't ask me why, they have not been as slick as the last couple of years. Liverpool, from the first kick, haven't been right. Chelsea, yeah. that's been turmoil. I've done a couple of videos on the Chelsea situation. Um Graham Potter. That's just a funny thing with how many players went to Brighton and have come back and, and Tuchel leaving. That's that's. But you're right. I don't think teams are playing in a you know in a slick, cohesive way. They no. don't. The, the standout players who you're looking to aren't performing. You're right, and I think it's opened the door. Arsenal have taken full advantage of the fact that this year is an open, an open door for them. Yeah, absolutely. I think on the Manchester City point, I think Pep coming out and saying what he said after the Spurs game just signifies where the problems are. I don't know if I'm allowed to. I can swear on this podcast, right? You can say what you can say whatever. I can say whatever you want. Yep. City have lost all these players who had big bollocks and were shit houses, and that is the problem now. The Fernandinho has gone. Vincent Company has gone. Further back, Fabian Delph, Zabaleta, Zinchenko. We don't have any nastiness, and Pep's completely right. When he, when he mentioned that um, Rico Lewis, the 18-year-old, is absolutely fantastic, by the way, got fouled four times in the space of about two minutes against Spurs. None of the players were crowding around the referee. Now, that would have never been a situation in, in years gone by. I think there's, I think it's really difficult, firstly. I think it's really, really difficult to maintain the levels because the playing levels and the training levels that Pep will have will be the most intense in the world. Maybe only Marcelo Bielsa will have more intense training than Pep Guardiola. And they've all been there for four or five years. So they've been doing it. It's going to be hard. You're going to get fatigue. You've had to adapt to a situation which you're not used to in a false nine and then that's taken away like that. And the whole aim of the game is to get the ball into the number nine. So that's going to take a long time to adapt. And the hunger just probably isn't there. Like the truth is, us fans want, want to believe that it's there because we absolutely love our clubs and we expect players to do everything for it. But if you've won two Premier Leagues, out of the last two, it's going to be hard to kind of maintain that same motivation. I think we're going to see a very, very different Manchester City side now after Pep said that. I think his comments have actually kick-started a, a, a real title race, really, because I think Arsenal were going to walk away with it. I think if Man City had lost that game against Spurs, it would have all been over. I think the comeback and the comments from Pep afterwards, he wasn't even happy about the comeback. He just wanted everyone in the world to know how angry he is at his players. So I think... I think the Manchester City thing, it can certainly be explained. And as you mentioned, the World Cup is is a real, real big factor because there are players playing at sort of 60, 70% from October onwards because they don't want to get injured. Then you have basically what is probably only maybe 15 days off altogether, especially if you if if you've got if you've gotten out of the group stages. And bearing in mind, this World Cup comes after 
a, a compressed COVID season, pretty much mm. two compressed COVID seasons, a really, really short break, a Euros where there was pretty much no break as well. So it's basically been kind of four years of constant football. So the players are understandably just knackered and you don't, I, I kind of like, especially working for talks, but you get lots of calls like they're on 200 grand a week. You don't, shouldn't feel sorry for them and whatever. And fine, I agree. But like they are knackered and I personally do feel a little bit sorry for them because they've had no rest. And you can tell, I mean, you watch the games this season, the quality is worse. And I think it can only be put down to fatigue, to be honest. A couple of interesting points there. I mean, as a, as a City fan, and I'm just looking at City in isolation. So they play 20 games. They're on 45 points with 53 goals scored. So we're judging them against sort of standards they've set over the yeah. last you know have however, however many years centurions i think they won the league with was it 99 or 98 points as well 98 yeah so you're talking almost 200 points over two years yeah you're on track to hit somewhere around 88 90 points that's yeah. still high no am amazing amazing don't get me wrong but the the thing this season, because obviously I go, I go home and away, I watch the games every single game. So like the results haven't actually been that bad, but the performances have been really lackluster, I think, this year. And it kind of frustrates me when people say that Erling Haaland's a problem. Obviously, there has to be a level of adaption to the new style of play. I understand that. But Manchester City would be absolutely nowhere near that title race without Erling Haaland because the performances from pretty much every single player, apart from... John Stones, Rodri and Nathan Ake, every single player in that side is playing at least 10 to 15% worse than they were last year. No one apart from those three have improved. And then we've got Haaland as well, which is obviously a huge help. He's already scored 25 goals, which is ridiculous. So, so yeah, I think the quality of, of the squad is is depleted. I think there's, there's obviously fatigue there. There's a bit of ageing element as well. You've got Kyle Walker, he's I think 33 now, Gundogan 32, even Kevin De Bruyne's about to be 31. So th there is a kind of element of ageing and maybe needing a refresh. And there's also disharmony. I mean, how many times does Bernardo Silva want to come out in the last year and say that he wants to move somewhere abroad, somewhere warmer? Just leave then. Mm -hmm. Just leave. like That kind of thing really, really doesn't help the squad. And since he came out with his last interview, he's been on the bench the last two games, which uh, no matter how much I love him as a player, I think that was a good move from Pep because it doesn't seem like there's that same love for the squad or the club as there has been previously. And I don't want to seem like I'm ungrateful. Look, I grew up watching some of the worst football, uh, you know, getting regularly hammered by United, which is, you know, the worst of the worst, really. And ne now... I support a team who's challenging for Premier Leagues and Champions Leagues every year. So I'm, I'm not, I don't want to seem like I'm complaining at all because it's still incredible football, but it's, it's a far cry from what it was uh, in terms of quality on the pitch. It really is. I think. It's an interesting point that you raised about um, that four year period, because one of the things, and again, you're looking on the other side of the, of the city now. So Alex Ferguson, he was a master of squad replenishment. Every couple of years he would get either a youngster in or he'd, He'd get an experienced head in. He was always supplementing his squads. And I look at the City squad, and I'm excluding this season for a second, and I'm just looking at centre of midfield or central of defence. You've got a Kanji in, of course, now, which was a brilliant buy. Yeah, great um, buy. You mentioned, obviously, Fernandinho. You've got Rodri there. Is it quite the same? Not sure. You, you mentioned Bernardo Silva. There's, there's rumblings of discontent there. Is it a case that perhaps... We're going through squad replenishment or having options or even like the Champions League final, Guardiola overthinking things, playing three at the back yeah. or th things of that nature where we're talking tidy fractions. Yeah. But I'm looking, and we'll take VAR out of it for a second, but I'm looking at the Man United game. City from a few years ago when you had, say, Leroy Sane and people like that, yeah. you're a goal up. The, the momentum is with you. You'd get that second goal, kill the game. Mm -hmm. This time you didn't get that second goal all the possession, you've got people like Foden who are great in possession, but they don't look like they're a massive threat. It's all it's all pretty, but there's no real second goal coming. And then of course, look what happened with United, they come back, they win yeah. the game. But we're talking about in years gone by, I don't I don't think that happens. Where no, and then I you've agree. got you've got Arsenal, who in those kind of games, that that rub of the green is going for them at the moment. So is it a case that this year is just one of those years, or is it a case that 
is Pep slightly to blame in terms of, like you mentioned Haaland, you've got Alvarez who could come on, you've got all these different options. Um, and it's, I've seen all or nothing. And he talks about, you know, like, like sniffing it, smelling those moments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Are, are you guys doing that? Is that the reason why there's that gap at the moment? Yeah, I, I don't think so. I think firstly on Pep, I don't think uh, he just can't be to blame. I think he can't be to blame. He's created a pretty much near perfect system, which has infiltrated every single level of football in this country, even down to Sunday League. He's completely revolutionised and completely changed the game. And what he's done at Man City is pretty much perfect. Yes, okay. If I think about the Champions League, I think about Chelsea and Porto. I think about Leon. I think about the second leg against Monaco. I think about the first leg against Liverpool. I think in all four of those games, he played a formation he hasn't played all season. That's frustrating and it's annoying and he's overthinking. And look, that's fine. With genius, you are going to make mistakes. And hopefully he, he's kind of figured that out and corrected it. But I think, I think as you said, the, the hunger seems to be missing. And I think the difference with Arsenal is they are just getting those moments like... I've been kind of up and down all season thinking like, will they, won't they, will they, won't they? They're only a couple injuries away from, you know, being in a bit of a t tough situation. They haven't done it before. They're not that experienced at winning leagues. But that result the other night against Man United scoring in the last minute, that's a, that's a, champions, that's a champions result. That is the absolute mark of a champion is that you, I think they were 1-0 down, weren't they? And then they were 2-1 up and then 2 all, And then scoring in the last minute, Against Manchester United, who's like a really, really old rival and a fantastic team now under Ten Hag, they're playing some really, really good football. Doing that to me, I just watched that and I thought, yeah, this is this is the side. They're they're taking their chances. They are getting the rub of the green, I suppose, in terms of potentially injuries. You could say, but I mean, that's also about management and it's about training. But they haven't had any huge injuries apart from Jesus, which they seem to have recovered from well. But in midfield, particularly, mm. I think. If Odegaard or Party or even Granit Xhaka get injured and they don't have a replacement, I think they will certainly struggle. But, you know, they haven't had those issues so far and they are just the masters of the, of these kind of moments where they're winning games. I mean, the Leeds game, for example, earlier in the season, I mean, that was one of the most one-sided games in the world from Leeds' perspective and Arsenal win that game 1-0. And that is what champions do. And City haven't done that. City had, I think, what was it, 79% possession against Everton at home and drew one all because mm. Demario Gray scores a wonder goal. Now, that wouldn't happen in years gone by and that wouldn't have happened with Arsenal either this season. So, football, as Pep always says, is, is it's about moments. They're capitalising on their moments and Man City just haven't this season and they, they, they've probably left themselves too much to do now. It's really interesting because the other thing which skews this partly down to the World Cup and, and all the rest of it. We're looking at teams that have played 19 or 20 games. City and Arsenal haven't played yet. And one thing yeah. that City have been really good at, generally speaking, over the last few years, is when there's a big game, Manchester Derby or Liverpool or whatever, they, they, they usually turn up and put in a good performance. And if they do turn up against Arsenal in that first game, and if they do turn Arsenal over, then eight points becomes five points, but Arsenal have another loss. Yeah, it might psychologically change things. Yeah, definitely. I mean, look, there's still six points to play for between the two clubs. So it's in Arsenal's hands because they're ahead. And, you know, if Arsenal decides to play for a draw and that tactical, that you know, that, that tactically works, then there's nothing Manchester City can do, really. I mean, I think out of the, there's 19 games left or 18 games left for City. I think they have to win 16 to have any chance of winning the Premier League and I think they have to not lose to Arsenal I think if if neither of those two things happen I think it'll certainly certainly be Arsenal's title but it makes it really really exciting and look like I'm as you know I'm a City fan so my ideal situation is that Man City win four trophies every single year for the rest of my life that isn't the case right obviously and, that's, and that, that would be terrible for football and that's one thing that I've quite enjoyed about this season is that that is really exciting now that is really exciting because you've got a team who's never done it before playing out of their skin, playing incredible football on to break records. And then you've got this giant football club with this genius manager who's won the last two seasons who have been off form, have now been given an absolute rocket up their arse, have to play that team twice and have probably got the slightly easier running for the rest of the season. So it's going to be, I mean, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. It's going to be really, really exciting to see what happens and, I, look, as a City fan, I have no beef with Arsenal. If if City aren't going to win the league, I'm more than happy for Arsenal to win it. I can see the stadium from my bedroom. So, 
you know, they're, they're, they're a club that deserve it. And I think they deserve it because they've stuck with Arteta, which I don't know any other club in the Premier League who would have. And I think it's fantastic that they're finally seeing the rewards. What's your thoughts then on Arsenal? Because obviously he's been there now. This will be, well, two and a half years at the end of this season. Um, I don't think anyone saw this. First of all, this this level of improvement from the players. Um, obviously, we were talking about capitalising on this season. Again, I'm just looking at their form, the goals scored, the goals, the lack of goals conceded, but also the quality of the football. Um, and from where they were, and the style of play that they were doing over the last year or so. I mean, has this caught everyone within the media industry by surprise? I mean, most fans, even Arsenal fans who I know very well, yeah, they give it all this because Arsenal fans do. Yeah. But no one in their right mind thought that Arsenal were going to play this well, this consistently for so long. No, and not this quickly. Not this quickly. I I think when you get a manager like Arteta, who's obviously worked under Pep, you you know kind of what style of football he's going to bring in. And you know that when you're a club that is the size of Arsenal, with the fan base of Arsenal, and that is probably willing to spend money, you know that some form of success, whether it's a, you know, being in the Champions League or a trophy, you know at some point it's going to come. But it coming two and a half years into his reign, I really, really did not expect. And the thing about Arsenal that's changed massively is that they've always played good football. Like, you know, when I was growing up, a lot of my mates would have a City top because they'd be City fans and they'd have an Arsenal kit because Arsenal play beautiful football. Arsenal were like the Brazil in England, right? They've always played beautiful football, but for the last 15 years, they've had no bottle. They've had no bottle whatsoever. They've had no metal. They've had no needle and Arteta has brought that in. And I mean, the kind of most shining example is you look at Granit Xhaka, right? He is probably not the most gifted footballer in the world. I think he's good. He's not the most gifted footballer in the world. He's, you know, it was only, what, two years ago, a year and a half ago that he took his shirt off and threw it on the ground as he was getting booed by his own fans. And look at like, the mentality that it takes, not only to come back from that, but then to captain the side and captain it so well. He's such a leader on the pitch. And that's what they've missed for such a long time. And they've got that now. And they've got players like Granit Xhaka and like Odegaard and like Martinelli and Zinchenko, perfect example, who just love the club. Like Zinchenko loves Arsenal. He's always loved Arsenal. He obviously really enjoyed playing for Man City. Of course he did. But he's gone there. He loved them. He supported them when he was a kid. And you can tell. You can tell that that is basically an 11 of like Arsenal fans who are incredibly passionate about it. Aaron Ramsdale, this is Yorkshire lad, has just come down to North London and he's just like fitting seamlessly. His personality fits mm, the club mm. perfectly. And so, yeah, Arteta deserves massive, massive credit. But the recruitment has been unbelievable. Like they have identified targets that they've needed and they are just perfect for the football club. Their, their 11 right now is absolutely perfect. Yes, they don't have the depth, which if they don't win the league, that will that's the only reason, right? The only reason that they, they might not win the league is because they don't have the strength and depth, but they're buying. They are, they are buying in January. Two transfers already. I think Caicedo for 75 mil might happen. I'm not sure what that's looking like at the moment, but... Yeah, they've just um, they've really got heart this year, and that's that, that's kind of one of the main differences. It seems like on the pitch and off the pitch, Arsenal have just upped their game. So you look yeah. at you look at um, the way that they were going to do their business. It was they who identified Mudrick first. They got yeah. outbid by Chelsea, but they they saw Mudrick was the mould profile of player they wanted, and they were trying to move yeah. quickly. They've gone after Trossard very quickly as a replacement. Get the business done. Yeah. They've got that Polish defender in. Kivior, yeah. Yeah, again, they've identified a potential weakness. They're moving quickly. They are, as you said, going after Caicedo. That, and this, I mean, he's a player who, he is, arg I don't know what it is. He is the most confusing potential transfer that I can remember in the sense that United were looking at him, could have yeah. signed him for four million quid, didn't. No one can quite understand why. Brighton have signed him. Liverpool yeah. were looking at him. For whatever reason, Liverpool haven't made a move. And now Arsenal look like they've, they're have they going to capitalise on that situation because they've realised, well, there's an opportunity here and they're going to they're gonna go for it. Yeah. They, they went for Thomas Partey when he became available from Atletico Madrid. Boom, swoop in, get him. Jesus, they sniffed, was he available? And very quickly, they got Zinchenko as well. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant bit of business, really, when you think about it. And well, I, I mean, if you... Sorry, if if you watch the documentary, if you watch the Amazon Prime, the Arsenal All or Nothing documentary, and you just watch how Edu Gaspar does his business, mm, mm. he's an absolute genius. The fact that he's a former footballer kind of baffles me because he's got such an incredible business man. And he works so well with Arteta that 
you're right. They just identify these players and they move in very, very quickly. And like the Mudrick deal is a perfect example because they're not going to be held to ransom. They don't want to be held to ransom and they don't want to pay for a player, you know, in terms of wages or transfers that's going to upset anyone in the squad. And I think them losing out on Mudrick, although his kind of against Liverpool was actually quite incredible for a debut. He looked amazing. But, uh, but if that's going to kind of unsettle anyone, then it's not worth doing. And Arsenal know that. And they're very, very, very well run at the moment, especially with Eddie there. He's doing an amazing job. It strikes me that um, you've got two personalities there, uh, Edu and Arteta. They both played under Wenger. And when Wenger first came into the football club, he was very, I don't want to say aggressive, but he was quite forthright. So he he was renowned for finding those gems and he moved quickly. He didn't let a transfer rumble on and on and on and on. Bump, let's get it done. Edu seems to be of that kind of mindset. Yeah. And then you've also got Arteta, who has obviously worked alongside Pep. And despite having all that riches, City will not uh, allow themselves to be held to ransom. You know, they, yeah. they were aware that Haaland had the release clause. They went after Kane. The amount of money that was quoted by Daniel Levy just to start things off, they were like, no thanks. They were prepared to yeah. wait. Knew that Haaland was available in a year. They've gone after Haaland. Done. The, and the way that they've always sort of accrued their players, and you think about De Bruyne and Silva and all these players, apart from Grealish, every single yeah. one, I think, represents great value for money. Grealish, we just need to wait. I think he needs to be given more time to see if that, that transfer fee is worth it. And you see with Arsenal... <laughs> 50 odd million quid for party i don't think anyone would blink an eyelid now and the no. money and the money for odegaard and the 20 odd million for jesus when he's back from injury and so on and so forth they, their business is not only is the profile and the speed amazing but the the financial element i think they deserve a huge amount of credit absolutely them. i think i mean you make the similarity there between city and arsenal and yeah if you take Jack Grealish out of the equation just for a moment. Every single player in the last five years that has been bought by Man City and has been bought by Arsenal is now worth way more than they were. Mm. They're all they've all increased in value. I mean, obviously you've got to take into account age that might kind of sway that, but they've all represented very very good value, and their player worth has been far higher than anything they've paid for. The recruitment from both clubs has been exceptional, but I actually think that's kind of just. A symptom of the Premier League. I think the recruitment in the Premier League is amazing. I mean, you look at what Brighton have done. How they've got Mitoma for one point five million. They bought Caicedo for what, four, what was it? Four four million. Quillian, four million. Yeah. You know, like they're, they're doing unbelievable business. And I, I do worry a little bit about the state of European football compared to the Premier League. I mean, I saw something on Twitter this morning about like the spend in January between all the Prem clubs is about 350 million or something so far. And the next is Bundesliga on five, I think, something like that, which is it is really, really worrying because the, the, the Premier League have the best recruiters, they've got the best training facilities, they've got the most amount of money and they've got the TV rights deals, which are absolutely astronomical, which no one else has. So I think there is actually a kind of element of danger in terms of European football falling by the wayside. But from a Premier League point of view, the, the recruitment is absolutely exceptional. The facilities on the whole are pretty magnificent and all the best managers in the world and f most of the best players in the world now are playing in the Premier League and there's got to be a reason for that, which is that people absolutely love the product and it's only getting better, isn't it? And like you said, this season, the fact that Arsenal and now another name, because next year, Chelsea will be back. Liverpool will be back. Man United will be back. And now you've got Arsenal. So you've got five teams that realistically probably going to be competing for the title next year. So there are very, very exciting things to come. I agree with you on that front. Um, I'm not sure about the European thing because I think there's always going to be elements that you sometimes can't just use money as a as a enticer. So, for example, Latin players, South American, Central American, there's always this draw about Spain. So I think, I mean, we see it with Lewandowski. He, he's going to leave Bayern Munich. Premier League clubs could have out, outbid Barcelona because they're broke, but he wanted to go to Barcelona. And I think there's just, some sometimes if somebody's got a desire, they are just going to go to the those two, you know, Spanish giants, Bayern Munich. I think, yeah. I th Bayern Munich, I think, are going to be there. It doesn't help that Juventus... Lord knows what's going on with Juventus. Every couple of years, they seem to want to do something yeah. to get a ban. Um, Terribly run. Italy is going through a bit of a lull anyway. I mean, when was the last time Italy consistently 
had teams you know fighting at the latter end of the Champions League it's but I think I hear I hear what you're saying about the the product of the Premier League which is great but also worries me as well because I'm seeing and this is this is something else I was going to ask you about with VAR. I'm seeing almost a tendency to try and make the Premier League more of an entertainment product and less about the game and the sport. The way that they introduce mm. VAR, some of the inconsistencies of decisions, to me, and the kickoff times as well, it just it seems to be trying to gear it around theatre. And don't get me wrong, sport is theatre. But you've also got to yeah. keep true to the, the fundamentals of the game as well. I don't. I don't want VAR to become almost like a, like a, uh, not a comedic thing, but like a byproduct or 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 something which is used for entertainment and takes away from like the purity of the game. We yeah. Want no. I, I I completely agree. I think, I think there is a danger of that, and I think that VAR is the perfect example because VAR is only good for neutrals. It's only good for neutrals, right? It's not good for anyone inside the stadium. It's not good for anyone who supports a club because every single club now has been affected massively by either celebrating a goal and going completely wild for it only to be chalked off or, which is by far the worst byproduct of VAR, not celebrating a goal that you really want to celebrate. Now, that is the worst feeling in the world because celebration of a goal is the pinnacle of any football fan and any footballer's life. That's the whole point. The whole point of supporting a football team is at the pinnacle to celebrate a goal. So if you can't do that and if that's being taken away because maybe television companies want to create a slightly more exciting product for the neutrals, which I understand because they're a business and they are the reason that Premier League footballers can bring in these amazing players because they're the ones who are basically the majority shareholders of the Premier League because they pump in the most amount of money, right? So I can understand why you would want to make it more appealing for a mass audience. But you are right, there's a real, real danger of actually like killing the enjoyment and the love of football from fans. And that that is something that worries me. I think VAR is a byproduct, byproduct of it. I think kickoff times are absolutely absurd. I remember not that long ago, maybe like three, four years ago, I had to get up at three o'clock in the morning to go down to Bournemouth from Manchester for a 12.30 kickoff. Now, no one's thinking about any fans there. They don't care. They're just thinking about what game they can show on the sky. Oh, it's the Champions. Let's put it at 12.30. Well, that's not acceptable. Ticket in pricing, completely unacceptable. The City City Spurs game the other day, I've got a season ticket, so I think mine's quite cheap because of my age. So it works out at like maybe like 25 quid a game, which is fantastic. Mm. But I went on the website to buy my friend a ticket for the City Spurs game. £68 was the cheapest ticket midweek. In Manchester, which is a working class town, like that's disgusting to me. It's not acceptable. And the more that football goes this way, you are right. That, I mean, the, the, the fans are just being left by the wayside. They have been for ages now anyway. And VAR is, is just another product of that. You can't celebrate a goal in a stadium anymore. If you score from a corner, you can't celebrate it because there might be a handball or there might be an offside. So, it, yeah, I, I, VAR has really, for me, killed the enjoyment of going to the game. I think, you know, when you watch it, like you watch the World Cup or whatever mm -hmm. and someone scores a goal and there's like a three-minute wait, I, I'm not going to pretend, even though I hate VAR, I'm not going to pretend that I don't find that exciting. I find that really exciting. When I've got no skin in the game, I do, I find it exciting. I find the wait exciting, then the cheer and the decisions, you know, revealed which way. It, it, it's, it is entertaining. But at the price of that is real supporters who have been shafted for years and this is just another extension of that. See, the difference is, if you look at something similar, like Hawkeye in cricket, or the TMO in rugby, or even mic'd up refs in American football, because yeah. you've got more transparency, and more screens, and more kind of like involvement with the fans, like Hawkeye will show if a ball is LBW, or if it nicked the bail off the wicket, or whatever, and then you see uh, if it's a try, or was a foot in touch in rugby, the fans can see. So yeah. if the decision is horrible, the fans will start cheering because they can see there's a try. And if the try is not given, you can hear the outcome. They're like, what the fuck? Because they can see mm. it on the screen. And then with NFL, you can hear the, the, the refs are mic'd up and then they'll announce to the whole stadium, we think the decision is whatever. And then it's, you know, first down over here or whatever it might be. At least the fans are included in that. The problem with VAR yeah. is you've just got VAR check going on up there. And you don't mm -hmm. know what they're seeing. And the the Man United game was really interesting when they when they played Arsenal. The winning goal, 
and this is this is kicked up an absolute stink on on social media because they didn't show anything on on sky in terms of what was the freeze frame initially for the goal to stand then it was released a load of stills were released online showing um was it i think it was trossard you had zinchenko and i think it was varan was playing him on what everyone was then saying is if you actually watch the american broadcasters who show the next frame trossard actually delayed the pass that he made zinchenko was offside so what are they looking at and i think that's why fans are infuriated because you've got something like that where they don't know what's going on and which frame is being looked at of course we had the issue a couple of years ago with somebody like i think it was son his shoelace or something stupid he was offside or he'd called for the ball and his hand was offside but you can't score with your hand anyway so how can that be offside um and they, I don't think they know what's going on. I think that's part of the... And then, of course, you've got the, the Man United City game. The Bruno goal, or was it a goal? And that's where the rules start becoming absurd. And VAR's now yeah. going... In one instance, they're going really anal to the to the letter of the law. And in another game, they're not. So the fans are like, well, what what the what the hell here? No, like, I think you're right. I think that the, the transparency is, is a huge issue. The fact that we can't hear the decision-making is a massive problem. But I think really and truly and I, I find it hard to say this because I do sympathise with referees they've got a tough job but the problem isn't with VAR because in the World Cup it works perfectly right there's no decision really that was very contentious in the World Cup because they're the elite of the elite the standard of officiating in this country is absolutely abysmal mm. it's so unbelievably poor for the amount of money that's pumped into the league for the fact that it's the most watched league around the world the standard of officiating does not represent that in any way shape or form and I, I've never really understood the this idea of like in the Premier League you have to have British referees why all the best referees are European let's pay them let's pay them some more and bring them over here and they can officiate here because the the, the standard of officiating is terrible I mean look obviously I've got a bit of skin in the game but that Manchester United offside with you know Rashford basically shepherding the ball for like 30 metres now the letter of the law would say that's offside, but the law has been changed so many times to accommodate different situations that no one knows the law. No one understands the rule. The referees don't understand the rule. The fans can't understand it. The pundits can't understand it. So there needs to be like a real overhaul, I think, of officiating because I think that really is the problem. I think VAR implemented well in terms of offsides, like, you know, using the 3D scan that they've been doing in the Champions League. I'm fine with that. I, it, you know, if it's a, if it's if if we're kind of taking your shirt length if, if you're taking a bit of your body where you can score from and you're offside is annoying because an art of being able to get past your last defender is putting your body in a particular position which gives you a natural advantage but look if it gives you a natural advantage and it's offside then it's offside i don't have a problem with that i have a problem with using var for subjective decisions because you're taking it out of one person's hand and you're giving it to four people to have a debate about when there's a live game of football and fifty thousand people in the stadium it's it's objectively ridiculous but it really, really doesn't help when you have the standard of officials in this country. And I'm not just talking about the Premier League. I know, I, you know, loads of mates who support the Champ- Championship teams, League One, League Two. It's really, really, really poor. And I think for a country where football has so much money, I think there's pretty much no excuse for it to be the state it is in. Do you find the level of inconsistency is also a part to blame? With the World Cup, and you get it with every major tournament, they're given a directive. And what happens is, it's it's pretty clear. Directive is whatever, here's your line. Anything above or below the line, that's that's pretty good. But the thing with, with VAR, I think, is you can have so many different decisions from one week to the next. And depending on who is the VAR team, you know, that <clears throat> go back to the Fernandez goal. If you had a different VAR team in there, you probably don't get the goal. But that's yeah. not what it's there for. The whole point is, obviously, yeah, we, we know about clear and obvious errors and, and all the rest of it but it should be pretty consistently conclusive. It shouldn't just be effectively what we've done at the moment, As and this is what I think most fans are trying to say, is we've got one set of officials on the pitch who, it doesn't matter who the official is, his opinion goal, his opinion not goal, and that's where we get our pub debate from. What we've done is we've gone from that to a bloke who's got a monitor who's only doing exactly the same thing as the bloke on the pitch, because this guy with the monitor would give the goal, this guy with the monitor wouldn't give the goal, that's not what it's there for. It's no, meant, I'm, and I think that's where there's, you draw the line, you make it conclusive, clear and obvious, or whatever you want to call it, a letter of the law or not letter of the law. But that's it. 
and then it's and then if you don't like the rule fine the rule's a piece of shit but at yeah. least it's been implemented and everyone knows all right fucking fair enough that's how we're going to play the game I mean, when you actually think about it, like it, it's laughably ridiculous. The actual idea of this VAR and the way it's been implemented is laughably ridiculous because you have three people in Stockley Park, 200 miles away from a football stadium. Mm -hmm. You've got three officials on the pitch. And instead of those three making the decision, you've now got... What VAR should be is you should make a decision so the linesman puts his flag up offside. If it's clear and obvious, all the VAR should do is say, you've made a mistake. I can see it on the monitor. This is right. That's all it should do. Because I know what's going on in the ear, which is why it's taking four minutes, is you could probably got three voices, four voices going, oh, yeah, but no, I think he was offside. But like, is that technically in the letter of the law? You know, they're actually having a debate. They're, they're debating whether to give the decision or not. What's the point in having a referee then? Just sat the referee off and have the three people in Stockley Park or just have one who's watching from a camera. It, it, it's actually like the, the way it's been impl implemented is laughably bad at the moment. It's, it's and, like, and the it's inconsistency like is earlier. ridiculous. Yeah, just like I said earlier. It's it's If you don't have that line for what it's used yeah. for, yeah. offside, goal, this, that, the other, then like you just said, what is the point? What, no point. What, why are you just adding to the debate as you just said over here? I don't have a problem with them being 200 miles away, but like you just said, with all these technology or the monitors or the angles, make sure that every decision is right. Yeah. And make sure you make, right. Since VAR has been implemented, there have been no, the, the percentage of correct decisions has not improved. If anything, it's probably got worse. Really? So what it, it's, it's absurd. It doesn't make any sense. I think it's ridiculous. And I think like, look, we can hate VAR for being inconsistent, whatever that's fine. And maybe they'll sort it out. But what VAR really needs to be hated for is the excitement factor. Because uh, as I've said, you can't enjoy celebrating a goal. And there's no point in buying a season ticket if you can't enjoy celebrating a goal. You can't even you can't even celebrate like a thunder rocket because you think, oh, there might be a man standing in an offside position who's slightly in the goalkeeper's eye line. Like, it's really, really, really destroyed it. Like, I look back, like, that Aguero goal, okay, that was the best moment of my life. I instantly ran down right next to the pitch. I was celebrating with, like, my, my dad, my brother, all my mates, whatever. I couldn't have done that. If that was today, I wouldn't have done that. We would have celebrated a bit. We would have gone a bit mad, and then we would have instantly looked to the screen, and it would have been waiting and waiting and waiting. Is he offside? Has someone done this? Has someone done that? Mm -hmm. And that's uh, that's too much for me. That you're taking, you, you know, you're taking the fun out of the game. The other the other thing, of course, is there's this argument about how far back do you do you look at an incident, isn't it? That's the. Yeah. I mean, the the big thing for me is I remember, I want to say two thousand six seven season, when West Ham and Sheffield United were in, were locked in that relegation battle. And there were a number of decisions or whether it was the ownership of the players or whatever. And Sheffield United went down and they wanted to put things in place to try and stop that because every decision is points and points means money and all the rest of it. Yeah. And what I don't like is you've had an incredible match. The Manchester derby was enthralling watch. I agree that the quality of the football point you made earlier isn't as good as it was a few years ago, yeah. but it was still captivating. And what you've got at the end of that game is a group of, if you include all the staff and whatever, 30 odd people. No one actually has a clue what the hell's going on. You've yeah. got City feeling aggrieved. Half the United team probably thought they got away with one. They probably don't think the goal probably should have stood. Half of them probably do. And at the end of the game, they're like, well, what the fuck are we doing then? Because if that happened yeah. again next week, I bet you any money that goal would be chalked off. So you've got two yeah. identical goals. One stood, one didn't stand. That's not yeah. how this is meant to be. That's No, no I agree. I agree. And look like, you know, back in the day when it was, there was no VAR, you can excuse human error, like referees are just humans, right? Fine. You make a mistake. And I'm, I'm a firm believer. I don't, I hate all the conspiracy nonsense. I'm a firm believer. And at the end of the season, everything comes back around again. Mm. But like you say, you can't have a game which next week would have been a different result. Next week would have been a different result. Next week would have been a different result. It's not, it's not fair. It's not in the kind of principles of football. The best team should win. And if they don't win, it should be based on luck. It shouldn't be based on one person's interpretation of, of a rule that is so vague it will never create the same outcome every single time I, so i agree with you and it's it's and the thing which is also equally annoying me with this is because of this lack of knowledge and interpretation and black and white understanding of the handball rule defenders yeah. are now they look it looks fucking ridiculous they look like mannequins in a shop window ridiculous, because yeah. they're having to put their hands behind their back 
Who on in their right mind will walk up to someone with their hands behind their back when you're jostling, trying to jump, trying to block or slide tackle? It's absolutely because. And then if they turn That's their ridiculous. back, then they'll argue. Well, it's in a natural position now because why is it behind your back? You can't. So ridiculous. You, but it's 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 madness. It's it's a nonsense. Absolutely. It got, is. And then you've got players who are looking. I've seen this before. And then the ball will hit their hand. How is that meant to be? Yeah, it's, no, it's ridiculous. And I don't want to be one of those kind of football fans who's like, oh, but like, you know, back in the day or when I was growing up, it was better because the quality was much worse, right? We are seeing the best football we've ever seen by far. Like imagine, you know, in in 2000 and so when I was growing up, maybe 2001, you wouldn't have had a player like David Silva in the Premier League ever. That kind of player couldn't exist. So we've got like a much better product in a lot of ways. But like you say, the, the the fan element, the fan interaction has been completely lost. It's been lost by VAR and it's been lost by referee re- refereeing decisions, which don't make any sense. And I'm, you know, I've worked with Neil Warnock quite a lot at TalkSport and he's kind of, I've always loved him and I've always loved the fact that he's not media training. He says what he wants to say and he's always been a massive proponent of referees after the game speaking. And I think being a referee is an incredibly hard job. Like you don't want 40,000 people calling you a wanker, right? It can't be great. Or calling you shit at your job. That can't be fun. <clears throat> but in the Premier League, look, they're, they're being paid enough. And if they make a mistake, just like any manager or any player, they should be able to come out and at least explain why they thought that or apologise for the mistake. But you've ne- you mean, I've only heard Mike Dean's voice now because he's retired. You don't hear them ever. You never hear them speak. So it's like... It's, it's frustrating. And as you say, like points means money and all of that. Like, let's say, for example, Manchester United now go on to win the league at the expense of Man City by one point. Now, you could bring that down to that one decision. I mean, obviously, yeah, look, this is 38 game season, whatever. But like, that's a huge consequence. I mean, okay, maybe it's not, not a good example to use City because they pretty much have unlimited money or whatever. No, but let's no, say they're coming up a, against it's valid, Leicester. It's, it's a valid point because it's not just the goal in the game which affects the result it's the knock-on effect it's the psychological yeah. effect and in that particular instance because the goal is so uh contentious it has an effect on well s- to certain scenarios down the line because it affects the way that you play the style of your attack and it will also affect the next officiate the officials because they've now got bias either for or against because of all the yeah. media for all so it is valid because and, you know, City second or finishing third, that has a difference on on automatic qualification for the Champions League and money and, and the rest of it. But you're, you're right, in a title or relegation battle, that could be a defining factor because it's not yeah. just the three points here or there. It's the knock-on effect for both clubs after yeah. that. And like you just said, with VAR, it shouldn't just be an extension of not knowing. It should be the definitive, Yeah, that's it. I agree with you I entirely. Agree. Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, we can complain a lot. And look, like I say, it's really difficult being a referee and I, w- I could never do it. And I think some of the, sometimes like, I'm watching it at the stadium and someone has a shot and it takes like the tiniest of deflections and the referee gets it right. And I just don't even understand how they've seen it so quickly. So like that, I don't want to be like really, really negative about them. I think it's a really difficult job, but mm. a bit more transparency and, and a slight improvement in either the quality of referees or the concreteness of the law would go a long, long way, specifically for like in-stadium and fan experience, definitely. I totally agree with you. And I think, you know, there's loads of different things that have been sort of put forward. Like, why don't you have four linesmen? Because how's a linesman who's looking after effectively one quarter of the pitch supposed to see through 10 bodies and get the, uh, you know, just anything to help the, 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 the referee or even have more than one ref you can have like sub refs like they do in American football who can be on hand to see sort of finer things and then tell the ref, yeah. look, I've seen something here. The ref can yeah. make the call. Just give the ref some sort of word in his ear. He can go and look at the monitor and then he can make the call. It's still going with the ref. Yeah. It's just, uh, I, I, and this is why I've just got this, this worry that football is being turned too much into like a commodity. We're trying to serve the market that's sort of putting the most the most money and they want to break America, they want to break the Far East. So the kickoff times and the way they package the product is is aimed to try and get that buy-in. What it's- I would say about that though is that I just don't think fans are gonna let that happen. Because they tried to do they tried to do it with the Super League. I was there, I was actually with Talksport at the Chelsea Stadium and they were protesting as we found out that Chelsea had pulled out of the Super League and it wasn't going ahead anymore. So, like, the fact that they've done that shows that, like, look, 
football club owners probably don't really respect fans that much. The TV rights companies and the TV companies absolutely do not respect fans. They're customers. But at the end of the day, you can't have a football club without its fans. It's not going to work. There aren't enough kind of like, as you would call them, like tourists or neutrals to fill grounds, to buy shirts. So the real power is with us as fans. But are we going to allow the game to be taken away or are we going to do what we did with the Super League? Because the Super League was a piss take, right? Like we've taken we've taken increased ticket prices, we've taken shit to kick off times. But the Super League was like a big fuck you from them being like, we can do whatever we want. And the fans are like, well, no, you can't. And then that was it. They, You know, they, they spoke with their kind of voices, they spoke with their money and within what was it, three, four days the Super League lasted. So the real power is still with us. But it just depends on, you know, whether we want to exercise that power and voice it. On the subject of fan power, there was um, a number of demonstrations. I'm just going to get my charger, sorry, one no, second. No problem. It's just got low power, sorry. I was just going to say that on the subject of um, fan power demonstrations, uh, obviously Everton fans and West Ham fans were um, getting their voices heard over the last couple of weeks. And we've seen Everton obviously parted ways with Frank Lampard, which again, we were talking about Gerard earlier. It's a shame that an ex-player who had such a stellar career, unfortunately, it hasn't worked so far in management. I mean, what was your thoughts on his appointment, how it's gone and where Everton go from here? Yeah, I think... I think it's really, really sad kind of what's happened to Frank Lampard. I know lots of people, I don't know why, I know lots of my friends and lots of people in the industry don't have that much sympathy for him. I can't speak about what he's like as a man, I've never met him, but I think that Everton situation is just an absolute disaster. I think he definitely doesn't deserve to be sacked, really, because he kept them up last year. Mm. With a, with a, They've got, I mean, you look at that squad, that's a really bad squad. That's a terrible squad. And then what they've done in summer is they've sold the best player, basically their only player with real quality. They've bought in Tarkovsky from Burnley, relegated. 30 million for, for Dwight McNeil, relegated. Andre Nana, fair play, been a good siding. Connor Cody, playing for Wolves, who are 19th, can't get in the squad, probably going to be relegated. So you've bought in three relegated or relegation threatened players to improve a side after taking away their best player. It makes absolutely no sense. That club is run so horrifically by Fahad Mashiri. They spent like 500 million in the last eight to 10 years or something. They, I mean, they appointed Rafa Benitez. They appointed the Liverpool legend who won them the Champions League, who basically admitted the only reason that he took the job is because he still lives in Merseyside and it was convenient. And they gave him the job. I mean, what do you expect? What on earth do you expect? You can't have success that way. And then Fahad Mashiri then came out a few days ago on TalkSport and blamed the fans for the Rafa appointment. It's like, wait, the, where's your head at? Like, this is not a correct situation. Everton are a massive, massive football club. They're about to move into a 60,000-seat stadium yeah. in probably <clears throat> Bar Manchester or on par with Manchester, the most historic football city in the world right? You've got this incredible support base. You've got this incredible football club. It's just being ran like, like a child. Like there's no planning. There's no organization to it. You just spend money in willy nilly and think that that's going to sort situations out. So I think Lampard's, I think Lampard's unlucky. I think you can tell once a manager gets fired, you can tell from players, social medias, what they thought of him. And everyone has come out and thanked him and thanked the backroom staff and said, it's sad to see him go. And I think that's kind of a mark of what they felt of him as a manager um, kind of the relationship they had, so I think I think he's unlucky. In terms of where they go, I think they've really got a, they've got a decision to make. Basically, do they want to stay in the Premier League this year, or do they want long term overall overhaul of Everton Football Club? Because if they want to stay in the Premier League, get Sean Dyche. He'll finish seventeenth. They'll stay up. But for the next two years or however long Dash is there, he probably won't push past tenth, right? It'll probably be between tenth and seventeenth where he'll finish, and Everton will just become one of those clubs like a Burnley. Now, if you want to completely restructure the club but have a massive risk of going down, then you go for someone like Bielsa. Now, I know Bielsa only signs one-year contracts. You get him to sign at least two years. You get him to commit his time if they are to go into the championship because he will completely revolutionise that club. He won't have any of what's been going on at the moment. He'll bring in his own players. That He didn't spend that much money at Leeds and look at the team he got. They finished 10th in the Premier League. 
you know, and, and with a worse squad, Everton have more money than Leeds have. So that, you know, but they probably will go down if they go that route. And that's the route that they want to go. That's what Mashiri wants. I don't think he'll keep them up. So if they're going to get Bielsa in on a one-year deal with the proviso that if he doesn't keep them up, he'll be sacked or leave, then there really is no point in doing that. So it really depends on what they want. If they want short-term success and to stay in the Premier League, then then Sean Dash is really the only way that they can go, I think. Who makes the footballing decisions at Everton? Because Mashiri is not a football man. He's like a financier. And he strikes me sometimes as a bit like Ed Woodward at Man United. Mm -hmm. In that, you know, he's almost playing... Um, I don't know what... It's almost like an ego thing for him. Whereas if you look at Roman Abramovich at Chelsea, what he did fucking fantastically was, yes, he's got all this deep pockets, but he was always trying to nurture the club to be yeah. self-sustaining. He had... Um, I've forgotten her name. Maria... Um, that that that, that hardest nails negotiator yeah. yeah 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 and he was like yeah i've yep. forgotten a second name and she she was like the daniel levy style negotiator got the best deals when they sold got the best deals when they bought when they identified through their scouting network off they go although there was an element i remember was it ancelotti when he was there when they went and bought shevchenko and said you have to play shevchenko all the time yeah but but with with some of the names that you listed for Everton, was Frank involved in bringing them into the team, or are they all above his head? And he was just said, "Here you go, you have to work with this." How, how did it go down there? Do we know? I, I, I'm pretty sure Frank won't have had a huge amount of say in in the transfers. Probably, I know. Obviously, uh, Mashiri had a problem, didn't he, with Marcel Brandt because yes. he was the sporting director, yeah. didn't want him anymore, sacked him. Now you've got to bear in mind that Marcel Brandt is the man who brought in, well, not brought in, but who oversaw you know, Ancelotti, James Rodriguez, these really, really excellent players, Romelu Lukaku, right? So Richarlison, these are like, wasn't Brent involved? Richarlison, yeah, yeah Richarlison. So like, these are the, probably the best players that Everton have had in the Premier League. Now, Mashiri, for whatever reason, I don't really actually know exactly what went on, but for some, whatever reason, he didn't fancy him. So he got rid of him. And the club since then, and previously as well, I suppose, has just been in complete freefall. Mm. I can't imagine that Lampard was given that much responsibility or, um, or I, I can't imagine he was given much power when it comes to transfers. Um, I can't really speak on it, but it doesn't seem like it. I think you just look at the Dan Juma case, for example. Yeah. So he'd done the media. He was in the Everton kit taking pictures. He'd done his medical and he was signing and he was signing because of Frank Lampard. Then Lampard gets sacked and he thinks, well, I don't want to be here anymore. Gets a call from his agent about Spurs. And I mean, who's not going to go? You know, that's, so it's like... Very good point. There's no planning at the club. I mean, the, the, you know, the, another stark example of this, but the other way around, is, okay, so though Mishiri wants Rafa Benitez. Ridiculous, right? Eff actually offensive, I think, to actually hire a manager who is your cross-town rivals in that way and who's called your club a small club and done all of that, the, you know, the bitter rivalry thing and is clearly only in the job for convenience and to be in the Premier League. I think, a, a, you know, a horrible decision for the fans. They were never going to be able to stomach it. But then... You have a player like Luca Dina, who's an unbelievable player. Rafa falls out with him, so they sell Luca Dina. The next day, they sack Rafa. It doesn't. That makes absolutely no sense. There's no sense being made whatsoever. It's like just willy nilly decisions being made off the cuff, and it's a shame because Everton has arguably the most passionate, loyal fan base because you know they they really really love their club and they're being treated like mugs. And Mashiri doesn't really know what he's doing. I, I, and, you know, I live with an Everton fan and I was speaking to him the other day. I don't think going down to the Championship is the worst thing in the world. Now, I know you look at teams like kind of your Wednesdays, your Ipswich, your Portsmouth, your Sunderland, who it wasn't so easy to come straight back up. But you, you would think with a club the size of Everton with the right appointment and the parachute payments, they probably would come back up. And I think maybe that's just what they need. Maybe they need a reset because it's been too long of average and below average Premier League football. Maybe... Maybe it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. I don't know. It's um, perhaps a bit of a relief for Frank because I've, I don't think, I mean, this is the continental model that it used to be that you'd have the, the coach, if you like, and the coach would be given all these players and it'd be like, well, go coach, go make it work. Whereas over here, man managers, and I'm talking about proper managers, they're the ones who give like the short list of, of players to, you know, whoever it is that's then responsible for getting them. If Frank's not being included, or is, is giving targets but not getting his targets. That must also be a frustrating situation for him because 
you're you're paid to keep Everton in the Premier League or achieve whatever position in the league. And part of your remit is to, if you've got this style of how you want to play and you need a centre-back, maybe you want a better ball-playing centre-back than a Connor Cody or a James Tarkowski. But if you're not being listened to or overruled, whatever it might be, what are you supposed to work with? So maybe for Frank, yeah. it's almost like, well, I'm, I'm almost doomed. Because unless by some miracle, this this crazy guy who's signing all these checks just gives me the best ingredients of players, I'm stuck. You, know, yeah. you look at Richarlison. Um, you were mentioning players who have left the club. You know, he scored critical goals for them last year. Calvert-Lewin is just too injury prone. So who have they brought in to score goals? No one. Yeah. So, you know, great, great sort of um, names there on the defensive side, but it's goals that win you games. And Everton have basically taken all the goals out their team. And yeah. And now, and, and now they don't have money. And now they actually don't have the means to be able to spend. I mean, you know, I think as football fans of another club and you're not particularly invested into the club, sometimes you get a little bit lost and you don't really understand what people are moaning for Like. A lot of people kind of poke fun at Man United fans for having a go at the Glazers when they've spent a billion or whatever. But they haven't actually spent a billion. That's come from the club. It's not come from them. And same with Mashiri. I mean, even like a couple of years ago, a lot of Everton fans I know were moaning about him. And I thought, well, actually, look, like you, you're not doing that well in the league. And he spent like 500 million. Mm. But that's not that, that's that's not the story, is it? The story isn't just about how much money you can spend. It's about where you spend the money, how you spend it, the way that you communicate with the fans, the way that your hierarchy works. And I think the problem at Everton, and lots of clubs like Everton, really, there's lots of clubs in the Premier League, that the manager is not is no longer the manager. It's a head coach. You have a head coach which is responsible just for the squad that you have and playing. You're not really responsible for anything else. And I think that's why Klopp and Guardiola and Arteta must be so happy because they have complete control over everything. Mm. I mean, if Pep, I think honestly, if Pep wanted to change the name of a stand at the Etihad, yeah. they would let him. <laughs> and, you know, and, and, and that is the way, realistically, if you believe in a manager, that is the way that you should run your football club. You let them make the transfers. You give them time, you give them money and you let them build their own squad because a manager can't work with someone else's side. You that's, just can't. It's really true. impossible. That's true. It's one thing I do miss about Manchester City. You're making the point there about naming stands. The uh, the Colin Bellend. Um, that, yeah. That, that, <laughs> that's the that, that that's the one thing I do miss about Eastlands. So <laughs> on on the on the Premier League run in them. So we've got any one of seven teams who could go down. There's three points yeah. between them. We've got realistically two teams fighting for the title, and then we've got anyone from Newcastle, Man United, Tottenham. And then possibly one other if they make a late charge. What this is for the top four, obviously. So, what are your thoughts in terms of relegation, Champions League, and and title winners? If I was to say, give me three predictions, three to go down, top four. Okay, I'm just having a look at the league table now. I think Bournemouth go down. I think Southampton go down. I don't think Southampton are good enough. And the third one is really, really, really difficult. I think. It really, honestly, really depends what Everton do and who they get. If they get Bielsa and they now, and they sell Anthony Gordon, make some money, 35 million, and let Bielsa bring in three or four players, potentially they could stay up. Potentially. They've got if they get four Dunn, days. Four days. They've got four days. It's just not enough, is it? It's just realistically, it's not enough. And I don't, and I think the way that Bielsa wants to play, um, then you need a full preseason, really. You can't get players who are used to like a low block playing high intensive football within pretty much one or two weeks, which is what it's going to need. It's not going to happen. So do we, the do Everton we, do, situation. Do we, do we have any murmurings as to who they're actually going to? I know Bielsa's favourite, but obviously. Yeah. But do we do we have any kind of inkling as to interviews or anything of that nature yet? Bielsa's favourite, and he is keen for a return to the Premier League. I don't think he is particularly enamoured with the hierarchy at the moment. And I think he thinks that it might take too long to turn them around. I think they are going to have to seriously in the next four days buy two or three players to lure Bielsa in, which I don't think they're going to do. So I would very much expect it to be a manager like Sean Dyche or like Ralph Hasenhuttle. I think if they get Hasenhuttle, they'll go. And I think if they get Dyche, they'll stay up. So I think the only other team that's sort of in the mix, I think I would say for certain, I think Southampton and Bournemouth will go down. And I think Leeds, if Everton sort their, sort their shit out. So Everton, yeah. just just for everyone who's uh, watching or listening at home, Everton have won three games. Three, three games out of 20. Three. 
three. That's the least in the league. The least in the league. And although they're second bottom because they've managed to get some draws, I mean, that's a, that's that's horrific. Three terrible. Games. Even Dice going in there. I mean, look at that record in their last five games. You've got four defeats and a draw. <laughs> it's terrible. And the, the thing that Everton have, and actually, you know, the thing that when you look at the table, probably Everton, Leeds, Forest have, is they've got incredibly iconic old stadiums packed every single week with vociferous fans. And that really, really does help. Everton stayed up last year pretty much because of the Goodison atmosphere. So they have that on their side. If they can start getting their home form, mm. kind of any, you know, just not losing every week at home, they've got a real, real chance of staying up. But it is, like you say, it's exciting. I mean, even if you look at Palace, Palace, who have been having an okay to good season, are only three points off Forest. They're only seven points away from the relegation zone. You know, that can happen in three games. I, really, really exciting. But I agree with who, you. Who, who, who would you say if you if you had to quickly say three to go down? I think Palace are safe only because yeah. Um, no, agree. although although they haven't got a goal scorer, uh, I've been to Selhurst Park this season. I've seen them play. They've got energy. They listen to Vieira. What Vieira started to do is make changes mid game that affect games. Yeah, uh, and they should have got something at Chelsea. Very unlucky to lose that game. Yeah, agreed. Uh, I think they've got enough to stay up. Forest, because they bought almost every player in the world over the last two <laughs> transfer windows. And I think Cooper's a good coach as well. I think he's an exceptional manager. I think he's in line for a top, top job. I think he's amazing. So I think Forest will be fine. Yeah, I think Le I think Leicester, I mean, look, v Vardy's in and out of the team because obviously his age and a few niggling injuries. Uh, Brendan hasn't had the best season in terms of decisions and who he's picking. But when they're down because they were in the relegation zone not long before the World Cup. They've just got enough that when it looks like shit might get real, they pull a victory or a couple of draws yeah. out the bag. So I, yeah. I, I think what you were saying before, So we're, although a lot of them are concertinaed on points, I actually think it's from Leeds in 15th down. I yeah. think Wolves with Lopetegui will be fine. I That's think, what I think. I think give him three or four more matches, get one of his main men up front, starting to score some goals. I mean, they've got... I mean, Ruben Nevers. How he's still there, I do not know. I don't understand. I don't understand Top that. four midfielder all day long. But yeah. I think Wolves will be fine. West Ham... I mean, they always say there's a team that's too good to go down. And I know that Moyes hasn't been great this year. But with Rice, with Suchek, who you fancy might just score a goal from nowhere, if they can get Jared Bowen anywhere near like he was last year. Yeah. I just fancy West Ham to have enough the, no, team, the, te the team i worry about to turn it into a proper four-way fight is leeds so yeah me too leeds everton bournemouth and southampton that's that's exactly the same it's but like you i mean <sighs> i think it really hinges on whoever and get i think it's, it's de i would say if i was a better man i'd say definitely southampton bournemouth and then it's between everton and leeds mm -hmm. and the recruitment of this next manager for everton is so 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 important because i don't think jesse marsh will stay the whole season and i think with leeds which is very which is a dissimilar situation from everton they can't just get in a premier league stalwart to defend and get them draws and keep up because their players are not those type of players they've been bred for a bielsa culture which which um which Jesse Marsh has tried to take over. So they're going to go for a very specific kind of manager. And I don't know if that can work. All right, then. How about this? So Everton go for Sean Dyche because Mielsa says no. Jesse yeah. Marsh gets sacked in a month's time because Leeds get down to sort of 17th. And Bielsa yeah. goes back to Leeds. Well, I would love that. How about that? I would love that. That would be fantastic. I mean, look, the thing is, realistically, if you're a football fan, you want Bielsa back in the Prem, don't you? Oh, he was, his, you want his, to watch his side. I don't want to see who he'd spy on next. That would just yeah. be brilliant. That would just be magic. Brilliant. Absolutely I, magic. I, I concur that I think it's those four. I, I, I don't, I think just because of the Leeds and Everton situations, managers and, and the rest of it, it's between those two as the third team that goes down. Yeah, agreed. Top four then, agreed. go on, hit me top four. Who's going Champions League? Top four in order will stay as it is now. Ooh, interesting. I think it'll be, I think Arsenal win the league. I think they'll win it fairly comfortable about six points I think City will definitely come second between Newcastle and United I think 
I don't really know. I think Newcastle probably will. I just think that this what Eddie Howe's doing there and the spirit at the club. And I don't know if you saw the other day, you know, Jacob Murphy waving off Coletta Sarr. He got sent off and Jacob Murphy was waving him off the pitch. Like proper shit shithousery behaviour. But that's what you want to see, I think. And I think that kind of winning mentality, that shit shithousery that Newcastle have got now, they're like a kind of quite a ferocious side. They've got St. James's Park, which I'm pretty sure they haven't lost out this season. What about squad believe? depth? What about squad depth? So, for example, Alan St. Maxim, Almiron, Joe Linton, Dan Byrne. You know, they're having amazing seasons, those players. Yeah. Bruno Guimaraes is having a great season. But again, where Arsenal have potentially got two or three who can come in. We, we spoke about Odegaard earlier. It, yeah. but, but, but they do have players who can come in and, and steady that ship. Newcastle, suspension, injury. I don't know, though, because, I mean, the way that Eddie Howe's got the players playing that, look, I don't, you know, you don't want to be disrespectful to anyone. Any you're going to say defensive, any, any you're, going to say, you're going to say defensive, aren't you? No, no, no. I'm just going to say, you know, particularly Jacob Murphy and Longstaff. Hmm. Like, if I'm being totally honest, before this season, I would say they're sort of mid-table championship players. But Eddie Howe's got them playing amazing football. So, yeah, you might look at... You might look at Newcastle's bench and you might think, look, there's not many big names there or traditional players who you might be worried about. But the way that he's got players who aren't of that ilk playing now, I wouldn't be surprised at all that if someone got injured and someone came in, he would have them playing in exactly the same way. And you mentioned Alan St. Maximum, but he's not even been starting since he's come back from injury. Yeah, very true. So, yeah, I think I think Newcastle have what it. I think they've got what they've got in Eddie Howe is an incredible manager. They're playing amazing football, but what they've got now is heart and like guts, and I think that will see them definitely into the Champions League places. I don't know whether third or fourth, but I think they'll make it. Yeah, and I think United under Ten Hag have been a completely different side. I'd be very surprised if they're not in the Champions League next year. It's kind of interesting because one of the criticisms of Eddie Howe when he was at Bournemouth was his teams were too easy to play against, not good too enough. Nice. Yeah, not good enough defensively, and he sacrificed a bit of that attacking flair. And he's made Newcastle proper hard to play against. Yeah, and he's made got him the, really hard. And he's got the fans back on board. And like you said, going yeah. up to St. James's, 50,000 fans there. Oh, I wouldn't want to do it. No fun. No so, fun at all. So, so top four we've got there. You've said Arsenal are going to win the league. And, and yeah. I, I saw a couple of tears rolling down your cheek as you said it, which is, <laughs> fi- which is fine. Uh, so Tottenham. Tottenham are going to finish outside the top four. Is that um, Chow to Conte? So the... So the, the the, oh, it's a difficult one for me this because Tottenham I work I, you know I've done quite a lot of work at Tottenham and every single interaction I've had with Conte whether it be like him just being friendly and saying hello or me listening to his press conference I don't know what it's like to be inside a Guardiola press conference but I can tell you to be inside a Conte press conference is like nothing I've ever experienced before like it gives me actual like hairs stand up on my arms like it kind of almost gives me a lump in my throat the way that he speaks so incredibly passionate about football like he absolutely loves football so much he's an absolute genius he's one of the best managers of all time I think and he has not failed with that Tottenham squad at all. I don't think it's a good squad. I really, really actually think it's quite a poor squad. And I think, you know, the the, the fact that Liverpool and Chelsea are in ninth and 10th, I don't even know, honestly, I, I think apart from Harry Kane, because Human Son's not the same player he is this year, mm. apart from Harry Kane, Kulisevsky, maybe, in Hoiberg, I don't even think they've got a better squad than, say, an Aston Villa. I look at that defence, It's not that's not a good defence. You've got an ageing Perisic, you've got Clement Longley who's not really fit in, you've got Eric Dyer, who, if I'm being honest, I don't think is a Premier League footballer anymore, I don't think he's good enough. You've got Emerson Royale at right back, you've got Hugo Lloris' bags of mistakes. You've got a midfield of Basuma, you spend loads of money on, you can't even get in the side. Sometimes Harry Winks, Oliver Skip play, and these are not Premier League footballers. So the fact that he's in, the, the fact that he's still in the Champions League and the fact that there's only three points off qualifying again I think is actually honestly is a success rather than a failure I think if Daniel Levy is really serious about Tottenham he needs to back him because Tottenham realistically look they've got an amazing stadium they've got a lot of fans but they're not traditionally a winning football club the last two managers they've had Bar Nuno and Spirito Santo they've had Jose Mourinho top three of all time probably and they've now got Antonio Conte who's won the league everywhere he's been You've had these two elite, elite, elite managers and you haven't succeeded. You haven't done anything with them. You let Mourinho take you to a final and sack him the week before. Like, they, they, you know, that's a terrible decision if you want to win a trophy. So for Levy to pass up this opportunity with Conte, I think would be a huge, huge mistake. I know lots of Spurs fans who I speak to hate the style of football, which is fine. 
Like it's it's a pragmatic style of football. It's not great, but if you give him two hundred million pounds to spend in summer, two hundred million odd, he will build a really really good side. And the football might be slightly more boring than it was under Pochettino, but the results will definitely definitely improve. Antonio Conte, the only manager that I can recall who actually looked younger when he was in his playing days than he does. Well, it's, it's just bizarre, isn't it? He, Crazy. He, 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 he's, what is he, 45, what, going on 50 now? And he looks yeah, young. Yeah, he must be going on 50. And looks younger now than when he was playing in the, in the great oh, he Juventus. he looks so good. In the, Juventus, in the Juventus team of the mid-90s when he played with Deschamps and Zidane and people like that, he looked like he was 50 then. He looks younger mm -hmm. now. How does that happen? He looks really good, and he's got a, he's got a brother who's on the Spurs coaching stuff who I see sometimes, and he looks exactly the same as well. I need same to... head of hair. I mean, it's, it's look, it's fake hair. We all know it's fake hair. But <clears> it looks <throat> good. Uh, just just for the purpose of protecting my ass, there's been uh, there's there's no proof of that. So Antonio, if you're watching, <laughs> I didn't say that. Uh, so we've got effectively a top five there. That means Chelsea and Liverpool, who in the Premier League yeah. era, era are giants of the English game. Yeah, I've done a couple of videos on Chelsea. I'm a big admirer of Graham Potter. I think if you give Potter time and money, he will turn Chelsea around. And Chelsea are definitely a long-term project. I think Bowley's made that clear. So what happens at Chelsea then? They're not going to qualify Champions League. They've got a fight on their hands to get into the Europa spots at the moment. Albeit yeah. they have signed some players. They've gone and spent, you know, 140-odd million quid this window already. Yeah, spent mad money. Uh, and we know what they're doing about this long-term contract situation as to how to get around FFP. Where do Chelsea go from here? What what does next season look like? What do they do in the summer? What what do you think? I think they're I think they're in a lucky position, realistically, that in my lifetime, no matter where Chelsea have been or what style of football they're playing, they've always attracted the best players. Mm. They always attract really, really good players. It's very rare that someone will be about to join Chelsea and go somewhere else. I even still think, which is a mad thing to think when you've got Arteta there and you've got Arsenal or almost winning the Premier League. I think the majority of players, it, particularly in an, in my age group, would rather play for Chelsea than Arsenal just because they've been a dominant side. I don't know if West London has something, you know, as well. You know, there's, there's kind of the allure of London, which maybe the Manchester and Liverpool clubs don't have, but they always seem to have been able to attract good players and the players that they're buying now are young mm. they are young talented players which suggests that graham potter is going to be given time to mold them i don't know necessarily whether he's had any say in the transfers but i think the transfers individually i think mudrick looks fantastic i think um badishel at uh, center back looks very very good i think they're going to get unkunku which is a great signing as well so i think they are making good signings even they might buy moises Casido as well which is going to be a great signing so i think look they've got a very very good good squad and they've got a young squad and if Potter is allowed time he will mould them into a very very good squad I think also Chelsea lo losing out on the Champions League this year or even losing out on Europa is not the end of the world it's not the end of the world at all I mean the fact that Arsenal are now out of the Europa League is going to benefit them massively if Man City beat them on Friday in the FA Cup they will have nothing but the league to prepare for they'll have a game every week whereas Man City will have one every three or four games so being out of the Champions League, yes, it may detract a, a couple of suitors. And yeah, you probably won't get as much money, but it doesn't really seem like that's a huge issue for Chelsea. So I don't think it's going to be the end of the world for them. I think they'll come back. I, I wouldn't be surprised at all to see them fighting for the league next year, or at least at least third or fourth. And, and with Liverpool, because a lot's been made, of course, about the lack of signings in midfield, the ageing squad, Klopp seven-year cycles that he has. What, what yeah. do you make of the whole thing? I think in the same way that Manchester City are having a poor season is the way Liverpool are having a poor season. You've got to remember last year, Liverpool played every single possible football match they could play. I don't think that's ever happened before. They are knackered. These players, you know, these players are rightfully absolutely knackered. In the same way that the way that they press, the way that they counter press is incredibly intensive. Training will be incredibly intensive. Klopp's been there for seven years. A lot of the players have been there for four or more. Mm -hmm. They're going to be tired. I think with Liverpool... It really, and, and I rate him so highly that I would say this. I think if Liverpool buy Bellingham, they will win the league or come second next year. I think that's how important he is. I think whoever in the Premier League buys Bellingham will win the league next year. So I think Liverpool have 
a huge task on their hands to get him to the club, which means really, really fighting hard to qualify for Champions League football because if they don't, he might be put off. But the fact that they haven't signed a midfielder when they've so clearly needed one maybe suggests that they're just waiting for Bellingham because he's going to be 100 mil plus, right? So with Liverpool, I think they're just tired. I think they're fatigued. I don't think you can really dig them out, really. I think Klopp's done an amazing job there. I think the players have done fantastic and they're just not quite the squad that they once were. If they do rebuild in the summer, like I say, and if they bring in someone like Bellingham, well, if they bring in Bellingham, that's, that's a game changer. He's a complete game changer for any side he joins. And he's looking like that's where he wants to go. I don't know. I mean, I saw a lot of the content from the World Cup. It seems like he spent all his time with Henderson and Trent Alexander-Arnold kind of make of that what you will. He always goes on about Steven Gerrard. It seems like they're quite confident that they're going to get him. And if they do, they'll be back. I think they've just taken his family hostage and said, if you want to ever see them again, you have to come to Liverpool. I think that's what it is. Honestly, if that's what it takes, I would do it. The, the, the weird thing I find about Liverpool, I hear everything you're saying, and I know that people like Nunes need time to settle in. And of course, Firmino and Jota have been out and, you know, they've lost Mane. Huge, huge loss. And yeah. I, I think that is a massive error from Liverpool's part. Um, there's a lot of, there's a fair few players who have played games this season who last year through just not being good enough or injury didn't play that many the likes of say joe gomez or the likes yeah. of uh Can i don't know how you say his name canate canata canate uh, yeah uh curtis jones the ox and yeah. they've come in because of injuries or because they've had young players filling in like harvey Elliott and carvalho who just aren't quite old enough to play 40 50 games for liverpool fine but if they've spent all this time getting fit with the bit between their teeth they didn't play 60 games last year so the fatigue element isn't there mm -hmm. i don't see why they would be so off the pace in terms of it's not just fitness it's just general intelligence as if like well, what am i meant to do i see trent playing as poorly defensively as i've ever seen him play the sort of the basic yeah. mistakes that he made when he first yeah. appeared and then you see somebody like the Ox, who this is the Ox at Arsenal when he lost his way, not the Ox at Southampton or when he first went to Liverpool scoring 25-yard screamers. Uh, I see Kanate, who he played against Milan, and Ibrahimovic said this guy's going to be brilliant. And then in other games, yes, okay, he's young and, and whatever. Uh, he looks a shadow. Robertson hasn't been as good this year, so they've had to play... Again, I can't, yeah, yeah, I'm glad you said it because I can't. <laughs> and then, of course, we've got Van Dijk, who I appreciate has lost a yard of pace. But one of Van Dijk's main attributes was his, not just the ability to see the game, read the game, but it was his vocal presence on the pitch. He was positioning everyone. He said to Fabinho, you stay there, we'll split, you drop in or whatever it might be. That's, yeah. That cohesion, that organisation seems to have gone to pot. And then, of course, Alisson has made the odd mistake as well. It just seems odd that so much of this is happening at the same time for Liverpool. Although what, Liverpool... what I would say, sorry, but what yeah. I would say is the players that you've mentioned, they have all had their injury problems and are coming back from injuries. Mm. Obviously, Van Dijk did his ACL; it just hasn't been the same since then. Mm. Same with Robertson; he's had a few injury problems. Canate as well. So, and Ox has just been hampered his whole life pretty much by injury. So, they've been very, very unlucky in that aspect, is what I would say. But I, I do agree with you. I think the the drop-off has been quite surprising. Not even just in terms of points, but in terms of the way that they're playing. They don't look ruthless at all anymore, do they? No, not at all. They're, and we were talking about City earlier, about this 5% thing where if the hunger isn't there or you just a bit of self-doubt or, yeah. like you said, this perfect storm, loads of things happening at the same time. Maybe that's what's happening with Liverpool. And maybe if you're a Liverpool fan, you think, well, let's get them all out of the way this season and then next year we can have the perfect season. But but we'll see so with the run in then um obviously we've got that to look forward to and that's going to be super exciting and you mentioned that your career over the last couple of years has been just an upward curve if you could pick a couple of moments or a couple of events that you were fortunate enough to cover or be part of as a presenting team or reporting team what to you stands out so far I think the most excited I've been was for the Chelsea protest with the Super League. Um, we were there at the moment that the Super League was disbanded and the kind of celebration and the joy from everyone there because obviously it was kind of like quite visceral anger that their club had, you know, partaken in this 
pretty much horrible consumerist like you know it was it's not a nice thing the super league so they were all really really angry and then it kind of got revealed that chelsea were the first club to pull out so being outside stanford bridge there was amazing um reporting for times and interviewing fans outside the euro final outside wembley outside uh, of england italy was absolutely incredible but he was he kind of one of those moments where it, it, truthfully in my head i was thinking i don't want to be working like, <laughs> i want to get these interviews out of the way now and i just yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, the atmosphere is too good i need to go and enjoy myself which i did in the end anyway so i can't i can't complain but i think that those two and then yeah the first the first sky gig and just seeing myself on tv like knowing that my mum and dad are watching me and all my mates are kind of like sending me pictures of me on just an no amazing, pressure no pressure <laughs> no but and, and i still you know i still i mean i'm very very new so i should but like still like the excitement the nerves before i go on like get like not jittery but like you know like you can kind of feel it I know in your you body yeah, yeah, when, yeah. You, when you're about to go live like i just i love it like I'm, i feel like it's quite addictive which is why i'm so keen to just like carry on progressing and getting on more things and doing more things so for the run-in and, you know, up to and including the summer, summer transfer window and summer sports, where can we sort of see, hear you, follow you in terms of reporting um, and being part of the action? So I think Sky is going to be the main place because I've just before Christmas in the last sort of couple of weeks, I've decided that I think TalkSport for the moment, because a lot of what I was doing there was production rather than reporting and presenting. So I've kind of laid back that for now so I can kind of progress as much as I possibly can because there were lots of times where I'd have to turn down press conferences or interviews with managers or players because I was producing, which as great as producing The Breakfast Show on TalkSport is and assistant producing is fantastic, but like it's not what I want to do in the end. So I've kind of laid back that. So Sky definitely is the place. Uh, I, I should be doing paper talk most Thursday mornings, which is absolutely fantastic. And then little reporting bits here or there and... Like you, I'm thinking of setting up a setting up a little podcast because I know so many people with such great stories, and I feel like even now I think there are some amazing podcasters. I think they're fantastic, but I feel like there's not like that much of a personal element a lot of times, especially with the footballers. You kind of want to ask them about football and the teams they've played for and stuff. But like, I want to know. I want you to describe to me in exquisite detail what it is like to have forty thousand people chanting your name. Like what it's like step putting that shirt on for the first time. You know, like these are like mm. everyone wanted to be a footballer. It's not just footballers. I've got quite a few lined up with like uh, ex-politicians and journalists and stuff like that. And I just think like kind of like what you're doing, asking them how they became what they are and getting a more in-depth look because I love, I, I love that kind of investigative side of people's lives. No, I totally agree. And that's the right attitude because too many people, although their delivery is good, they turn the conversation about them and that's that's not what it's, it's it's about the guest it's about having a conversation and it's about yeah understanding and delving and and sort of going it's like layers of an onion and you just slowly get your way through and you know we've spent a lot of time talking about not your job but your background and what gets you excited and why you made the choices you made and where you're going and that's what people want to know yes yeah. they want opinion but of course, there's forums to, to get that. And you, as you've just said, every Thursday from seven o'clock, paper talk on Sky Sports. <laughs> but but the, the person behind the voice or the person behind that appearance and what's so-and-so like? You just said completely off the cuff, Antonio Conte, charming, lovely guy. You were talking about Alan Brazil. You're giving these kind of nuggets that otherwise people would never know. And that's that's brilliant. And then you can have conversations yeah. about all other things on the side. I, I yeah no I, I agree I, I I I fully support it I think you should definitely definitely if you can find some I, free time I, I mean how have you found it you enjoying it love it absolutely love yeah. it because I the, the the whole point of this is it spans an awful lot of areas like you politicians current affairs people in sport people in music loads and loads of people slowly to to be coming on and it's a I advocate this to be a place where they can talk about whatever they want. There's no judgment. There's no um, ill feeling or anything. We're trying to understand the people. Not, you know, if they've got a book to plug or something, that's great. But what about behind that and experiences yeah. and opinions? And you might know somebody for playing guitar in a band, but did you also know X and Y is that? And these are the sort of things that people go, oh, fuck me. You know, it's it's yeah. whatever. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, 
you know, they have to be media trained for their jobs, whatever you do. But I, I'm a big advocate of just be yourself. Use whatever language yeah. expressions you want. That's that's what this is all about. Really. Yeah, it's felt really comfortable. It's just a chat, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's like that's all it's supposed to be. Which yeah, I think I think you know, the where where I did my masters actually, City University of London, they've just today announced that they're doing a masters in podcasting, just podcasting. And I think like the that medium is just growing so much because you, like you say, you can actually just get like a personal look at someone. You don't need like these news lines or like specific, like what do they think about this one thing? You can just have and kind of extended conversation with someone. I really, really rate podcasting a lot and it's definitely something I want to get into. I mean, that it's great that they've got a course, but at the same time, I mean, I've done things like martial arts and boxing in the past and that's great. You know, you can do it for physical, you can do it for mental benefits as well. But I don't like just this fixation with going down one particular path. Yeah, I, no, and, I agree. And one of the things about the conversations I have is although there's like a very lo like loose outline of things that I'd want to talk about, sometimes there's things that other people want to talk about. If you were to have a conversation with your mates down the pub or a stranger or whatever, the conversation will do this. It will zigzag yeah. all over the place. And that's what you should try and promote. You shouldn't try and have a fixed plan. You should just let it just be organic. And that's just where, naturally develop. Yeah. I mean, if you've ever been out for a night out with your friends, the best night outs, uh, I'm not going to really like uh, reveal too much, but the best night outs <laughs> are the ones where it just, it's completely unplanned. You go with the flow. Yeah. Same here. Same here. Spontan yeah. The spontaneous ones are always the best. It's interesting though, that you mentioned that like about boxing and martial arts and stuff, because I've always needed like an outlet for kind of the sort of more mental health aspect of mm. things like anxiety and stuff. I've always felt like I've needed something. So I've always played football. I've always done kind of boxing and i think like podcasting as well can be that same sort of thing it's just a project to throw yourself into to maybe not avoid but maybe overcome the kind of but maybe anxious feelings you're having or maybe mental health struggles that you're having at the moment and i think like that's why the fact that these kind of hobbies are now turning into careers is so 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 exciting and i think no matter how bad it is for whatever many reasons i think that's why social media really is is one of the kind of founding principles of it it's fantastic that we can express ourselves in the way that we want to doing a hobby doing something which is helpful giving our time to something that they can then you know become a career and become something that we want to do i agree and everything you've listed there i purposefully didn't put down so we can get you on the next time as the premier <laughs> league and everything is is progressing to talk about things like that because mental health has become it's no longer a taboo it's something that people need to talk about uh, yeah. activities hobbies and the rest of it so you see as as we can start to track your your predictions which are set in stone uh and kim will have to um do a forfeit if he's wrong by the way he didn't realize that he's agreed <laughs> to do that that's as, fine as as the premier league um sort of um makes its way towards conclusion we'll get you back we'll talk about other things as well and we'll see absolutely how I'd love you to. are in the meantime, what, what I'll do is I'll include all your handles in the description. So when this goes out, people can follow you. They can see you on YouTube. Uh, they can see your appearances on Sky Sports and others. And cool. you've, you've also name-checked some of the other publications that you're in as well. So we'll make sure that people follow you 100%. Appreciate it. Nice one. In the meantime, thanks, thanks very much. No, thank you. Really enjoyed that. Brilliant. Uh, and stay tuned for another episode coming your way very, very soon.